Now, um, allegations of allowing Tata Tele and Arcom to migrate to USAL after waiving off the license fee was try was going beyond its mandate and helping the companies to profitability. That was one of the allegations that was made against you. Let me explain. <clears throat> uh, Tata and Reliance had CDMA spectrum. And all the other mobile companies had GSM spectrum. And historically, GSM spectrum uh, went to mobile phones and CDMA uh, spectrum went to fixed lines. And I thought to myself, we are short of a spectrum, why are we wasting a spectrum? Because why do you connect two phones by a mobile, by, by, by wireless? Because these phones can move because it's wireless connection. So why don't you allow the connections to move? So I went through a consultation paper, I consulted all in the industry, I had consultants, and then I changed the regime which allowed uh, Reliance and Tata's to change their fixed line telephones for which they had a license to mobile telephones. Now it was more, uh, the justification was more to increase the competition in the sector and not to waste a very valuable resource, a spectrum. Mm -hmm. But when I did that, I said the level playing field must be maintained. So I said, they will also pay what the mobile players have paid. In the case of Reliance, they had gone a little beyond and they had misused the license in doing partial uh, mobility also. So I fined them 5,000 crores. The, the total uh, spectrum size was 1,600 crores, but they were fined 5,000 crores. And that 5,000 crores, the office came up with the calculation, etc., etc. So they were fined 5,000 crores. And then I didn't decide. I made this recommendation. This recommendation made, uh, went to uh, the government. And then from government, the recommendation made, went to a committee of secretary. Then from committee of secretary, the recommendation went to the cabinet. And this was approved in the cabinet. So the charge was that I have helped Reliance and Tata Tele in, uh, in, in, in uh, being more profitable. Uh, one of the letters, Raja's letters, went to the principal secretary of the prime minister and uh, you've written that he called the section officer in the PMO and said that the prime minister has instructed that such letters should not be put to him and he should be allowed to distance himself from these issues. He sidestepped the whole issue and he left people like you and Parikh you to see, face the music. You see, I really was not concerned because I was not in the government. This story <clears throat> I read in the newspapers and then I got the documents also uh, because these documents were uh, roaming around uh, in the media. So this was something which happened in the government because when all, all this became very hot, when all this became a huge controversy, then the Prime Minister told his principal secretary, uh, keep me away from these papers because they were basically not PMO papers, hmm. they were basically DOT papers. So the uh, principal secretary told the section officer. So the section officer noted on the letter that PM doesn't want to see this paper. That is the incident which I uh, read in the media, which I have reported. But it's odd, don't you think, that he would specify that he doesn't want to see them? He could just as well ignore them. Well, I can't make He wants to sort of I, make an I official can't. statement that yeah. don't sh yeah, I don't I, want to know what yeah, Hira they're up to. Yeah, I can't make a judgment on that. But uh, that is what uh, happened. And, and I kept questioning the CBI that how can you examine me and how can you cross-examine me on a, simple, on a simple recommendation. If the government doesn't like the recommendation, they can throw it back at my face. But and CBI, CBI has been known to and in your case also uh, was planting stories. And for example, NDTV was running for days, they were running that you were going to be arrested. On what basis, I don't know. So did you ever speak to anyone in NDTV or not? Yes, Where? yes, I did. And uh, they said that we are a, that, uh, we are a uh, channel and we have to report uh, the news that we get. So I said, where, where are you getting this report from? So he said, from CBI. CBI was planting it. Yes, CBI. So it then, then, then there was you can't say whether it's a plant yeah. or a source. Yeah. 
Then there was a very interesting story that they found papers uh, in my house of a bungalow uh, in Chennai next to a Hawala trader's house. <laughs> I've never been to, I, I said I've never been to Chennai except once when Maran had called me. And that was a very inappropriate time to buy a house even if I had the money. And in Chennai, I have nothing to do with Chennai. But those stories also kept coming that uh, uh, that uh, I own a house in Chennai. So all sorts of stories were being planted. <coughs> then one day, <coughs> at 2 o'clock in the morning, no, no, 11 o'clock in the evening, a friend of mine in CBI rang me up, that look, I am ringing you up uh, at a grave personal danger to myself. And don't question me and don't discuss. I'll disconnect the phone in one minute. Just run away from uh, Delhi and come back after 15 days. So I consulted my lawyers and they said, look, we have been telling you to run away from uh, Delhi and I ha had not agreed earlier to some lawyers which I still work with me. And uh, uh, so after this guy rang me up, I left and I did not take my mobile telephone so that I could be located and I went to Ranthambur and I thought I'll see some Saw tigers. Saw some tigers. Yes, and I didn't. <laughs> no. and I didn't see any tigers. When the real tigers were waiting for I, you I, in I, the Congress I, party. I, I wouldn't have enjoyed those tigers also in my state of mind. So I went there and I stayed there for some time. Then after some days a friend of mine found out my number and he rang me, why are you staying, why are you run away? I said, look, I don't want to talk to you. He said, no, no, you come back, stay in my house. Because my lawyers had told me that, look, if you run away, I said, if I'm going to be arrested, I'll be arrested after 15 days also. He said, no, no, this is not happening. And this will not happen. After 15 days, your story will become a minor story for CBI. And then you will not be arrested. So I came back after 10, 15 days. And, uh, but they would then, arrest you on what basis? Yes. The story that I was told by uh, these officers was that uh, you are not cooperating in the investigation and therefore they have to arrest me to do some custodial, uh, uh, some custodial uh, interrogation along with Vinod Vaish who was Secretary Telecom at that time. So to have both of us in a room in custody and then uh, cross-examine us one against the other because the two players were the government and the uh, tribe. Now, Maran had put pressure on uh, the Tatas to merge Sun TV with Tata Sky and that also came out in the Ralia tapes. Um, you were exposed to that also? Wasn't, there, wasn't Maran embarrassed about it? <laughs> well, uh, well, I can't uh, I can't gauge his reactions but uh, he was a very aggressive kind of person and he wanted to uh, implement something which he thought should be implemented and he must have thought that look we operate in southern India they operate in northern India maybe the MNA together will be a very strong company he must have thought there are legitimate re reasons and that is why I had fear. Well, hardly legitimate reasons because uh, you're a minister and it's conflict of interest and you're black, near, nearly, bl well, you're blackmailing a company to merge when they don't want to. Well, when I told you that uh, there is a conflict of interest between a telecom minister and a TV channel, these are precisely the kind of situations that I had in mind because I was a broadcasting regulator and I could have fixed uh, Tata's uh, Tata's TV, not Tata Telephone. I would have fixed them because of my regulatory powers. So, uh, therefore, I thought that there was a conflict of interest. But the people in government didn't agree with me. Now, when you were going through all this and you're being interrogated by the CBI and all these stories were coming out, it was big news everywhere. Did you find that you discovered who your true friends were? Or did you <laughs> suddenly become a leper in some circles? Yes, I, I, I do accept that I became a leper. Even some of, my, uh, some of the people who had worked with me, and they had gone places because I had got them promoted, uh, they wouldn't take my telephones. 
A number of my friends wouldn't take my telephone. There were very few people who took my telephone. Well, that's is that, what it is. Um, you think it was based on fear? Yes, positively fear. And that is why I have written in my book that I'm very impressed with Sarma, who was uh, the telecom uh, regulator at that point of time, who gave a report that what I did was absolutely right and I couldn't be faulted. Later on I met him and I said the, 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 the condition was so bad, the atmosphere was so bad, how did you give that report? He said, sir, I gave that report because I believe that truth always prevails. And if I had lied at that point of time, truth would have prevailed later and I would have been in trouble. Well, Mr. Baijul, you're not the first person in India who's been harassed like this by the government and also by this through the CBI. The CBI has been an instrument of this and um, we see elements of this continuing in fact with this government also where people are being uh, hauled up. We don't know whether they're true charges or whether they are charges based on political need to fix people. So we are living, would you say, in a Kafkaesque country? Well, <clears throat> in my case, I was very clear that I had done no wrong. And all throughout my service, I uh, was on assignments given to me by the government where I was working on a razor's edge, like telecom regulatory authority, like secretary disinvestment, where you are <laughs> selling goods worth thousands of crores. So that taught me two things. One, never take a decision on your own. Always have committee decisions. So if you recall, there have been many disinvestment inquiries also. So if you recall those inquiries, I never took a decision. All the decisions were committee of joint secretaries, committee of secretaries, committee of ministers. You also questioned on this hotel yes, in that's Rajasthan. What I'm that's what I'm saying. Jayavilas. Yes, that's what I'm saying. That in all my decisions, I never, <clears throat> in one case, I never took a decision myself. The decisions were taken by committees. And therefore, I was able to save myself and I was very proud of the fact that no one can catch me. And people used to ask me, oh, uh, you must be collapsing, you must be having blood pressure. I said, others have blood pressure because of me, not me. It's another matter that after four years, I did succumb to all these pressures and I had to go through a huge bypass surgery. It was the cumulative effect of four years of intense pressure, day after day, these CBI guys with their, uh, with their uh, patties coming to my house. And I don't stay in an independent house. I stay in a, uh, a multi-story uh, block. It's a colony, it's a gated community with 1,000 uh, flats. And when these uh, CBI people came to my uh, house, they never came alone. They brought a whole lot of cameramen, so a whole lot of... Uh, cameraman, NDTV, Ashtak, uh, uh, Times Now, everyone with uh, lots of cameras and so everyone used to ask me ki kahan phas gaya aap? Kya kar diya? Then even uh, uh, if, I, if, I, if, I, if, I, if I if I gave a dinner at my house, people uh, used to question in their own minds because I was told that uh, how is he giving this dinner? Because when you have an inquiry in India initiated against you by the government, the presumption is that you are corrupt. Mm. So it was a terrible period. <clears throat> so this then, I think um, the last question is also the questions were raised and it was written in the press about your consulting company, which was promoted by Neera Radia. And you explained that you did uh, wait for the period that is required before you s started anything similar to the job you already had. Is that, uh, am I correct? You see, <coughs> uh, again, everything that happened, I have written in this book. The question How did you know Neera Radia? I, I'm coming to that. Every, all the questions that you asked me, I have given replies in this book. And why I have done that? I have done that precisely because I don't want others 
to go through this experience. So they must learn from my experience and I have read and therefore I have done this. You see, I have written in my book that after I finished my service, IBM called me for an international seminar. And in that seminar, there were two sessions. One day was privatization and the second day was uh, telecom reforms. And after both the sessions were over, five IBM boys who were working in different parts of the world came to me that Mr. Bajal, you have done extremely well by being able to, uh, by, uh, being able to pressurize the public opinion in the path that you took, privatization or telecom reform. And what you achieved was unbelievable because in disinvestment, I got much more money than China or Russia, etc. In telecom, the tariffs had been brought down. These were very unpopular uh, uh, efforts as you started. So please, after you retire, please start a company and we five boys will resign and join your lobbying company. So the idea came to my mind and they said, we have looked at the law, lobbying company is allowed in India. So I thought about it. So after I retired, one year was the cooling off period and after that one year cooling off period was over. CM Vasudev, a batchmate of mine, a very bright person and a very conservative person. When he came back from uh, Washington after doing his World Bank directorship, I said, uh, what do you think about this? So he said, it's a very good idea. And we uh, consulted a lot of venture capitalists. The rates were very high. During this period, Neera Radia approached me that why don't you start a consulting company? I said, no, no, I don't want to uh, get near your, uh, your uh, public affairs company. That's not my core competence. He said, no, 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 consulting company. So I agreed and we opened a consulting company. That's how it started. How did you meet her? No, she uh, sent me a word to a friend, to a mutual friend. So that was the first time when yes. this company issue came up. That's the first time you met her. It wasn't any old association. No, 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 no. I didn't know her from Adam. As a matter of fact, I think that also I've written in the book. When this proposal came to me, I rang up a number of my friends that there is such a proposal. What should I do? I said, we don't know her. What so, do you think of her? No, I, I'll come to that. I have also written that in the book. So uh, she said, uh, so I asked a lot of my friends, who is she, what is she, how is she? So I said, we don't know her. Because she used to consult for Tata's and she used to consult for a lot of MNCs. And she was not known in this country. She, was, she used to do her work quietly. So he said, all right, you Google Neera Radia. So I Googled Neera Radia. And I found a very few entries on Neera Radia. Today there will be 100 pages on Neera Radia. And it said that her son was, uh, her son was kidnapped and all that story was on that Google page of hers. So that's how I got to know. So I went and met her and I found her very professional, I found her very knowledgeable and throughout the period that I worked with her, number one, on the side of my company, she rarely took interest. And on the side of her company, we rarely took interest. But I found her very professional. But one point, since I'm a bureaucrat, I was always concerned that she was always talking on the telephone. <laughs> so I said, look, you, you, you do the sensitive work, don't talk on the telephone so much. But she was very fond of talking on the telephone and therefore she was talking to everyone and that led to all her problems. The tapes. The tapes. But on work, she was a professional. The second problem was she was a divorcee. The third problem was... Why is that a problem? I'll tell you. She was a divorcee and she wore very flashy clothes. So, you know, uh, uh, against such people in India, you can start any number of uh, controversies. Mm. So that uh, was a problem. But in her work, she was totally professional. I don't think I've met a woman quite like her. I will she not, is, uh, since there she is uh, quite amazing. Yes. And I have, been, I have been very shattered once these inquiries started and the CBI and this and the newspapers. But she's not been shattered. She's gone and opened a very advanced cancer hospital in Mathura. And she's running the hospital in Mathura. She, has, she follows some guru who yes, she is doing some. it for... Yes, and she, 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 she's a very religious person and she goes to a guru. And I was very pleasantly surprised that Ratan Tata went and inaugurated her hospital. I was also invited. 
I didn't go. I said, look, uh, our association has not benefited either of us. So let us forget it. But she's professional. In a way. So and what do the lobbies do? I have a case. And the lobbyist goes and explains to people that this is my case because I'm not keen. And this happened in USA, this happened in UK, this happened all over the world. But Neera was a little more proactive than that in the sense that the conversations that she was having on pushing ministers into positions and, and she's, see, she's I, I think her, I, I, again, her public relations is far deeper than any well, public relations I, one I, has ever heard. I again think that we Indians are uh, always susceptible to overstating. You know, I, I have uh, I've had education for some time in the United Kingdom. No professor or no professional will discuss anything with you mm -hmm. except what you are discussing. But we Indians we discuss, we discuss everything. all kinds of things. We discuss what the president did, what the prime minister did, what uh, the president of another country did. So uh, we are very fond of rumors. And that's why... And boasting. Uh, and boasting. And that is precisely what she was doing. And why was she doing it? Ask her. I, uh, you've written that I asked TRI officers and the economists attached to TRI the rationale behind such an ADC. No one could explain it. I'm talking about the yes, I, I, access I, def deficit I know, I charge. Know, I know each page of my book. One of the outspoken advisors told me that the ADC regulation was virtually dictated by the representative of one of the mobile operators. Was you that see, reliance? It was like this. It was like this. Was it no, first of all, since I have uh, worked with Reliance in a, in a consultancy once, so therefore let me state at the very outset that it was not Reliance. Okay. But uh, let me tell you what the story is. You see, whenever you change over from a centralized telephony system like MTNL, BSNL to a private telecom system where there are a number of companies which join the network. So at that time, to enable BSNL, etc. to survive, you have an ADC regime, excess deficit charge regime, so that these guys can weather these storm. And it's an internationally recognized method of a starting network telephony with private sector. So when I joined, I found that there was a regulation where ADC had been imposed on fixed line telephones, which were mostly BSNL, MTNL. And who was getting relief? BSNL, MTNL. So what was happening? The tariff of BSNL, MTNL was going up. So what would have happened? BSNL, MTNL would have been out of business. So I said, how have you written this uh, regulation? So this, one of the uh, advisors said, look, a mobile company uh, chairman came and dictated the regulation. And that is what was issued. But the only mobile company... Mm, there, were, there were many mobile companies. Who would dictate it is Reliance. No, no, there were many mobile companies. No, there was Mr. idea. No, 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 no. There, there was idea, there was Airtel, there was... Uh, and let me tell you, there were escorts, and let me tell you, oh, there were six, seven mobile companies. Who listens companies. to them? No, no, no. no. The, Nobody you are, you, listens to idea, making, escorts, you, 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 you or Sunil Mittal. You, you, you are making a judgment. Yeah. Uh, I'm coming to a, since, since, a guessing conclusion. Since I have worked with uh, Reliance at a point of time, <coughs> as it, an You were saying it wasn't them. Therefore, I'm clarifying that it wasn't them. Okay. And at that time, and at that time, they weren't even a mobile company. Please remember. They were not a mobile company. They were this fixed line telephone company, which I converted to a mobile company by taking from them 1,600 crores, which the mobiles had uh, paid, and 5,000 crores as a fine, with the approval of the cabinet. Mm -hmm. Now, you've also mentioned um, in your book that the who's who of the Congress party was, after the, was involved in this conspiracy uh, of blaming you when Raja and Maran got into problems. You so, see, would you, uh, are, are you saying that it's the ministers? Was, was there was it a couple Sibyl? Was it all of them put together? You see, I have, <clears throat> when I wrote the book, I wanted to tell the whole truth. And in the book, I have told the whole truth. And I'm very scared that if I, if I slip anywhere, I'll be in severe trouble. So I have said the whole truth, and I have documents to uh, prove the whole truth. And most of them I have uh, put in the book. 
Now, who's who is in uh, that finance ministry's letter? That finance ministry's letter clearly brings out who's who. And uh, then uh, so the press th was no. full of who's who all the time. So, so I have given who's cuttings. Who? So that is uh, uh, Kapil Sibyl and Chidambaram. Whoever were the players, whoever were the players. Sorry? Whoever were the players, yes, these two. And uh, Maran, who was an old minister, and he was a guide of uh, Raja also, because he was very senior to him in the party. No, one can expect it from Maran and Raja, but I'm talking about the other ministers who were you advising, see, you who see, were pushing running, this conspiracy. They were running a coalition government. And perhaps, they could not, not succumb to the pressure of DMK ministers. But th these are, in fact, these two happen to be lawyers, respected lawyers supposedly, um, to be involved in a conspiracy which is totally fake. Well, I uh, don't want to interpret it as a conspiracy. You it in you your see, book. Whatever you, you see, said it's a conspiracy in your book. Whatever you see by that letter, because I wouldn't have written all this, but for that letter of the finance ministry. You said it was then that I realized I was not facing an inquiry, but a carefully designed conspiracy. Yes. yes by the who's yes, who in UPA Yes, too. yes. That is like this. When <coughs> the inquiries started against me and I gave all the papers and the uh, people got all the papers and I also gave them this uh, uh, affidavit of try, I thought the story was over. But then I have given dates in the book that the inquiry went on till about six, seven, eight months and even later the inquiry went on and on, on after everything was clarified. So I have written that I felt that I am not uh, facing an inquiry, I am facing a conspiracy mainly meant for publicity. Because for everyone mainly knew. meant for diversion yes. from where the real problem was. Yes, absolutely. And so that you were right. basically collateral damage as far yes, as they were concerned. Yes, that is why precisely that all these statements uh, Raja made that I only followed Badger happened the day after the uh, report of the uh, CAG. And how was that CAG report obtained? The CAG report was obtained by removing files. Now it's shocking, it's horrifying that CAG has, uh, has uh, audited the documents, but he did not have access to the documents. It's horrifying. You've uh, said that to the best of my understanding, when action is taken against CBI officials for a fraudulent charge sheet, you know that will never happen, unless you file charges against the CBI for what they did. You see, I went to my lawyers and I wanted to do that. My lawyers advised me that we will not allow you to do that. Why? <laughs> they said, uh, you had your uh, innings, you got into a huge problem, you got out, now go and play in the flute. That's terrible advice. You've also added that Justice Patil and Kapil Sibyl's name should also be added to the fraudulent let charges. Me, let me, let me. Can you explain Justice Patil? Yeah, yeah, let me explain this story to you. An inquiry was set up by Sibyl that the nine years of telecom policy files should be looked at by Justice Patel. And then he should find out who did what wrong. First of all, there were no complaints of our period, but in, an inquiry was set up. Then the inquiry says nine years files, one month. Each case of ours took years in the Supreme Court to decide, same judges. How could a Supreme Court judge accept that I'll tell you everything in one month? What was the key? The key was that this Supreme Court judge will not talk to anyone except the serving officers, serving officers of the DOT. Now, naturally, the serving officers of DOT told this judge whatever the minister wanted to tell them. And then, if you read the report, which I have accepted in the book, it's touching. The judge has been able to find out that the section officer is responsible, in this case, this Babu is responsible, this assistant director is responsible, secretary is responsible, minister is responsible. Now it's very touching. Why, then, why touching? Touching that a Supreme Court judge need to do this function and he agrees to do this function. 
then all these uh, cases went to the CBI. And CBI looked at all these cases and they said two are prosecutable. Mushkil se. Two are prosecutable of our period. And what were those two cases? My case and Shamil Ghosh's case. My case, they could not reach the FIR stage and I'm very proud of it because I was able to explain. And they reached the FIR stage in, uh, in uh, Shamal Ghosh's case. And ultimately the charge went to the judge and the judge said that this is a fraudulent charge. So the <laughs> case which had the maximum material, that was a fraudulent charge according to the judge and he said, you uh, prosecute the CBI officers who made this fraudulent charge against Shamal Ghosh. Now, so you can understand the level of scrutiny of Justice Patel, who made 30 charges. None of them were even found by so-called compromised CBI, which it was not all the time. Some officers were. And uh, so I said, if they are charged, Sibyl should be charged. How, how did you uh, order such an inquiry, where the Supreme Court judge will only sit in a closed room and only will talk to your subordinates and give you a report. And one month for nine years. So I said that this was all perverse and that's why they should be prosecuted. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Baijal. I suggest that you do not play the flute. I would encourage you to go ahead and file charges against it. Somebody has to do it at some well, point. Lots of people have said that you, uh, they've suggested like this. But I think first, I've got too tired. And second, after I had the, 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 the huge bypass operation, four arteries, eight blockages, I have tried to keep myself fit. Today I play 18 holes of golf, just, to, just not to collapse. So I play 18 holes of golf, but I'm mentally very tired. No, but this will charge you up again. You've got a new heart. You'll have a new mission, <laughs> and it'll have it'll create a precedent, which yeah, is very I'll, important. I'll, I'll because my... when this happens over and over again, when one government repeatedly, and then another gov subsequent government, they all keep doing it. It's not one government alone that uses the CBI as its own tool and ta and par caged parrot. I think that one person takes it on, you will be setting a huge precedent. Well, let me also tell you that I've written the book precisely for all the officers who are doing their service again. Well, you're scaring the daylights out of them. Nobody's <laughs> going to take a decision. <laughs> that they're already not taking unless uh, we correct uh, uh, some of the provisions of law. And uh, I'm told in one case the provision of law, which is draconian, is already under stay. And that is that even if I don't take money from you, but if I cause harm to the five rupees, harm to the government, I am prosecutable under the Prevention of Corruption Act. I understand this clause is under stay in one of those uh, cases which are going on. And uh, so I have written the book for everyone to read and everyone to understand. But I have written the book mostly because I thought I had been so wronged and I had been insulted so much that I must tell the whole story as quickly as possible. So that's why the first book that I wrote, it was a small book, uh, I uh, wrote the book and I uploaded it on the uh, web. So do you feel better now that the book is out and you've, oh, I mean, you've had interviews by almost every television channel well, and first, it's been covered? The first book, nothing happened. After a couple of days, some journalist noticed what I have written. So he picked out one story, you asked me ten stories. He picked up uh, one story and wrote a huge article, one and a half page article in Times of India. And after that, hell broke loose. So some of my friends said, now you run away from the country. No, no, why? So this is the away. time to enjoy it. That is what my uh, friend said. Even today, lots of my friends said, don't write the book. The story is over. Don't write the book. Enjoy yourself. But I wrote the book so that I could uh, get it out uh, of my system. That's why I uh, wrote the book. Lots of people from the Congress party, incidentally, have come to me. When is your book coming? So I said, no, I'm Because they want to check if they're in it. No, I said, no, they, they, they know that they can't be in it because non-telecom sector. So, are you, so I said, but I'm thinking of not writing the book. I have written any book. No, no, you must write the book. <laughs> so the, the, the dislike or the like 
is not party wise. There are many people in the Congress party also who have huge sympathy to my case and uh, vice versa. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. Thank you. If you enjoyed that, click up here to support us and down here to subscribe. Be sure to check out our older episodes and the other stuff we do like Can You Take It, I Agree, panel discussions, comics and animations and much, much more.